we have a new mic, we have some new wine, we have a new me, uh, and we have a new outlook on life. So we're gonna get back into it. Hello and welcome back to Wine Reform. Today we're going back to France and we're going to Minervois. Uh, Minervois is a small village within the region of Languedoc-Roussillon. Um, Languedoc-Roussillon is an AOC that is along the Mediterranean coast uh, and it has wine history that potentially predates the Romans. So if you're interested in any of that um, archaeological historical evidence, I'm going to link it down below because I thought it was freaking dope. So if you guys are into that, definitely check it out. Now. Languedoc-Roussillon is a wine region that has far fewer restrictions in terms of growing techniques and uh, what can be grown and wine making techniques and so on and so forth. Uh, because of this, there's a lot more diversity in wine making just throughout the whole region. So overall, the terroir for this whole region uh, has very hot and dry summers, very cold and wet winters, it's got a very rugged landscape, there's uh, sea breezes from the Mediterranean, cold air coming in from the north, um, there's a lot of south facing aspects, which is kind of cool, uh, which, it mean, which means that it gets, uh, well it gets that sun kind of evenly throughout the day, so that's interesting. Um, and the soil itself is a lot more diverse, however in general there's a lot of shale and limestone marl. Now, <laughs> Minervois. Uh, Minervois is along the Canal du Midi um, and it is higher in elevation than a lot of uh, Languedoc-Roussillon. Uh, also, it is a Languedoc crew, which is pretty cool. Alrighty, now Minervois is made up of five different climate zones and they're very well mapped, so if you'd like to check them out, definitely give them a look-see. Like I said, these are all in French. It is in France. Duh. So um, if I butcher these, which I'm going to try hard not to, words on the screen. Now, there is Côte Noire in the northwest, La Clamont in the southwest, uh, La Zone Centrale in the middle of that region, uh, Le Cosse in the northeast, and La Sare in the north southeast. Wow. There are tons of wine grapes grown all over Minervois. Now, for the reds, there's Grenache, Syrah, Mauvetre, I tried, <laughs> Carignan, and Cinceau. And for the whites, there's Vermentino. Roussan, Marsan, <laughs> Bobelanc, and Grenache Blanc. However, um, the reds are a bit more well known, and that's also what we have, so we're gonna focus on those reds. Now, for a wine to be considered a Minervois AOC, it has to be at least 60% Grenache, Syrah, and Mauvedre, and then about 40% of Carignan and Cinceau. Grenache is a thin-skinned red grape that's got sort of notes of spice and berry. Uh, the berry more often comes through as raspberry. Uh, Syrah is a dark-skinned red grape that's got very high tannin as well as notes of dark fruit, uh, smoke, pepper, leather. Mauvedre is a small and thick-skinned red grape that's got um, very high tannin and umami and herbaceous kind of notes. Carignan is a tough little grape with high tannin, high acid, and intense color, so it tends to be added to things that needed a little bit more color and body. Finally, Senso is a dark-skinned red grape that's got very low tannins and kind of perfumey notes. So all of these together do kind of make a really good blend, hence they're blended a lot. So the wine that we have today is a 2019 Minervois whew, from Benjamin Darnot. Um, I did receive this uh, as a gift, as part of a Naked Wines voucher. However, looking at them, looking at the wine individually, it was about $12 on average per bottle, so not that bad. Benjamin Darnot is a winemaker who works with Naked Wines. He does not have a vineyard per se. He kind of goes around Minervois and handpicks the grapes that he wants to use for his blends. So um, it really is... Um, it, he, he, is, he is a pretty new winemaker on the wine scene, um, although I've heard good things, so I'm kind of ready to get it open. But before we open the wine, pause, subscribe. I would love for you to join the Wine Dabbler fam. I release videos every other Friday because I found that's more sustainable. Uh, and be sure to hit the bell icon next to that subscribe button so that you're notified when I do release those videos because we're all in different time zones. Sometimes that notification is helpful. Uh, finally, stick around until the end to join our chit chat in the comments. 
So back to the wine. All right, guys, I wish I could, I wish I could transfer scent to you over video because that just, I opened it up and it smelled amazing. It really did smell fantastic. Also, look at how dark. Hang on, I'll show you. Eh. <laughs> look at how dark that cork is where the wine touched it. That's just, that's, that's, I like to see it. I like to see it. Nah, nah, that's too risky, fam. We're gonna do it this way. Whoop. Okay, we got the drips. We got some drips. So the first thing we do when evaluating wine is we look at it because I don't know why we start with that. I guess it just makes more sense. Anywho, got my handy dandy white sheet of paper, got my wine here, and we're gonna take a look-see. Ooh, that is pretty. All right, this wine is ruby, um, almost magenta, and it's, as I kind of swirl it in the glass, I can see it sticking to the sides and kind of coating it, my glass, with this beautiful purplish hue. Um, it definitely has a, I'd say it actually has a medium intensity, which makes sense. There's some grapes in there with some high tannin, uh, some with lower tannin, so I can understand why the intensity would um, sort of be more in the middle, peter out towards the edge. And the wine is just so gosh darn clear. Oh, she's beautiful, she really is. Like looking at this, just I wanna drink it already. It's just so pretty. Also, we don't do enough red wine in this channel, so perhaps that's why I'm kinda hype right now. Uh, anywho, yeah, um, <laughs> ruby, color, uh, nice medium intensity, and phenomenal clarity. <sighs> Beautiful. Oh, I can smell it now. I can smell it now, guys. Okay, so the second thing we do when we evaluate wine is we sniff it because, uh, you know, nose and palate kind of connected, very important. We pay homage to our nose. This is how we do it. Alrighty, so. Let's give it a sniff. Oh, she smells so good. She smells so good, you guys. All right. So it's extremely fruity. It is so fruity. I definitely got that dark fruit and that red fruit. Um, it really came through to me as blackberry, raspberry, and plum, which I think smell fantastic. It smelled so juicy. Um, I got a little bit of that sort of herbaceous quality coming through as like a green pepper, very vegetal. Um, and I got mullein spices, which I thought kind of just, you know, I was like, ooh, oh, that's nice. Like it was right there at the end and it kind of came last, but it was seen, it was, it made its presence known and I appreciate that. Oh, and finally the intensity of the nose, it was medium because I kind of, I put my nose like right above the glass and I could smell it, but like if it was down here or something, I, I can't really smell it. So medium intensity on that nose. Finally, we are going to taste the wine. We are evaluating the palate, so let's give it a sip and see what we think. Cheers. Oh, that's good. Okay. I tasted everything I smelled and it felt even juicier, which was Getaway fly, which was awesome. Um, the tannin was medium, the acidity was medium, it felt dry, it felt balanced. Um, but even though it felt, even though it was a dry wine, it did feel very juicy and kind of like biting into a fruit. It just, I just got a burst of that flavor, which I thought was kind of awesome. Um, the alcohol felt medium, the finish was medium, uh, did not linger as long um, on the tongue. And it was just really pleasant. This kind of feels like, kind of feels like the nectar of the gods, if you know what I mean. Like I can't, I can't sip this and not picture myself drinking it out of a golden goblet while dining like sideways, like if that makes sense, like laying down and being fed. And then someone hands me a golden goblet, this would be in it. That's what it kind of tastes like to me. Um, which was freaking awesome. And I honestly wish I had the money right now just to make that happen because you know I would. Um, <laughs> in terms of pairing, I think this would go really well 
with um, like tapas, if that makes any sense. Uh, I think it would pair well with things that got a bit of bite, a bit of bitterness, um, but also a nice rounded flavor. So olives, um, tapenade, bruschetta, just, you know, hard cheeses and things with a little bit more, I don't know, bitter spices. Like, oh, um, shoot, there's this one, there's this one spice combo and it's called, it's got sumac in it. Gosh, if I wish it would, I've had it before many times on like with olive oil and on some like bread or something and it's just, it's amazing and I just can't remember what it's called. And everyone's got their own unique blend but it's always gotta have like sesame seeds and sumac and salt and it'll come to me. When it does, I'll put it here. Okay, um, but yeah, I can see it working very well with things like tapas. Um, I can see it working extremely well with dolmas, with bruschetta, with tapenade, with, um, shoot, Middle Eastern food, I think. It just, I don't know why, it just feels like something that would go with food from around the Mediterranean. I wonder why. Um, but it was very, very delicious. So I think if you are looking for a nice juicy red that might be more of a crowd pleaser than perhaps the super heavy red, um, red blends are the way to go and this Minervois, so good. It is so good. So I will leave you with that. And I will leave with this. Thank you for joining me for this episode of Wine Reform. Uh, I had a blast getting to try a red wine with you guys. Um, another wine from around the world. Uh, hopefully you guys will be able to find a wine kind of like this um, for a, re a re relatively reasonable price point. I think that's the coolest part of being able to try a lot of wines. Um, as not necessarily the most the it's not necessarily the most expensive wines that are going to have the biggest impact on someone and um, you don't need to have an expensive wine to experience a wine from somewhere else, which is pretty cool. So yeah, what's the juiciest fruit you have ever bitten into? I am genuinely curious, I would like to know because uh, I think every area, every region has their own amazing fruit to offer. And I think the juiciest fruit that I had ever had was, um, gosh, ages ago, I bit into a peach in Georgia and it was just bursting with flavor and ripeness. That was the juiciest fruit I've ever had. This is the juiciest wine I've ever had, or rather, this is the juiciest wine I've ever had, but the juiciest fruit I've ever had was definitely that peach from Georgia. Um, so what about you guys? What is the most mouth-watering fruit you've ever gotten to bite into? So I will see you guys in two weeks, but until then, cheers. Huh. Gotta refill my glass, but whatever.